The lathe is a simple machine. It is a single powered spindle which the workpiece is mounted to, so the workpiece can rotate in only one axis at a time. Yet, with some thought, complex shapes can be made. Because of this, as a general manual machinist, if you were to own just one machine, it should be a lathe. In the past we've seen cubes made using just a lathe, and as fun as that is, it's actually very easy to do. A regular dodecahedron, however, is more of a challenge. There is a key feature of the dodecahedron that we can exploit to machine this shape, and that is opposite faces are parallel to each other. You will see later how this comes in useful, but let's begin the process with sawing and facing some brass stock. Regular viewers of our channel will be familiar with this little watchmaker's lathe. The machine is a custom build, but this project can be done on more or less any lathe. Regardless of the price or quality, every machine has its quirks that we must work around. In my case, my four jaw chuck is not perfectly axial, so I swap for the more accurate six jaw to face off the opposite side of the workpiece. Now we need to make a specialist tool to go in the lathe. This piece of high speed steel will act as a shaping tool, which is the process I will use to define the angle of the flats. I begin by cutting off a length of high speed steel. Since it's been pre-hardened, we can just notch it and break it to save a little bit of time. To grind the clearance angles for the tool to work properly, I use a tool and cutter grinder. These grinders are incredibly useful, but I want to make it clear that it's not a necessity. The shaping tool could also be made by hand grinding, or filing a high carbon steel such as O1 and then hardening it. In fact, O1 is actually harder than high speed steel, and in certain applications can last longer. I begin the grinding process by flattening off the end of the tool and cleaning up the end face. At this point the end of the tool is just ground perpendicular. Next I tilt the tool over by just a few degrees to produce front relief. On a usual turning tool, this angle is typically around 7 or 8 degrees. Shaping tools, however, see higher cutting forces, so normally we would use a smaller angle. In this case though, it's only a little lathe, so the cutting forces can only be small, even in a shaping operation. In these non-production situations, sometimes it's best to just respectfully ignore the theory and use some judgement instead. We add some side relief to the tool, and that's it done. So now the blank is roughed and the tool ground, we're ready to move on to the tricky bit, which is the shaping. To begin, I mount the brass blank onto a superglue arbor. Concentricity is not too important, because the outside diameter of the brass is still oversized. So once the superglue has cured, I turn down the outside to size. I mount the shaping tool on its side in the tool post and shim it to the correct centre height. The front of the blank will eventually form one of the faces, which means five of the faces need to be shaped with a top slide angle of 26.6 degrees. This number is calculated as the dihedral angle minus 90 degrees. Next, we need to index the spindle in 5 increments. I use the CNC rotary table here. If you're interested in learning more about this attachment, check out one of our previous videos where I show the making of a watch gear.
You'll notice here that rather than shaping an entire face, I've chosen to shape a groove at the correct angle instead. This is because the cutting forces required to shape an entire face would just be too much for this little machine. I'm reasonably happy with the result, but I thought some rake on the front of the tool might improve the cutting performance further. In retrospect, I think this helped slightly, but in the end it probably isn't necessary. So that's one method to form the angle registers, but how about another? We could mount a milling spindle to the lathe top slide to mill the grooves instead. I wasn't sure if this should count though, since this requires the addition of another powered spindle, and then it could be argued that this is no longer really just a lathe. If you have any other ideas for achieving this, using just the lathe, let us know in the comments, we're always interested in hearing them. So now we have our shaped grooves, we can remove the workpiece from the superglue arbor with a sharp tap. The next step is to make a special superglue arbor. This is in fact the exact one I used in the watch gear video, and as I explained when I made it then, I made it too long so I can use it multiple times and for other projects such as this one. This needs to be made to locate in the shaped grooves. Firstly, I mark the depth of the locating tang. This is not critical as I will make it over length. Next, I use some layout fluid to allow me to mark two lines to saw to. Normally, this would be a job for the milling machine, but to keep with the lathe only theme, I use a hacksaw and file and guide the file with the double roller attachment. Another option here is to carefully file by hand or shape in the lathe by reciprocating the cross slide. The tang is a slightly loose fit in the grooves, which is required to allow room for the superglue. As you can see, once the superglue has been applied, the fit tightens significantly. Now it's time to face off to form a die face. I bring in the tool until it makes contact and reset the top slide dial. This then allows me to measure the material removal to ensure the face finishes up at the correct size. I remove the workpiece from the superglue arbor, index it round to the next shape groove and then repeat the process.
and that completes the machining on half the die. Now we're on to the home straight because all the other faces are opposite to those finished. It's just a matter of mounting onto the superglue arbor and facing off the opposite faces, removing the shaped grooves. So that's the machining of the dodecahedron complete. Using this method the concentricity of each face was not defined, so the facing patterns look slightly random. This can easily be removed with some emery paper. I tack it down to some float glass plate to ensure each face is kept flat. I'm very pleased with the shape, but I thought this would also be a good opportunity to make it into something useful with the addition of numbers onto the faces. There are a plethora of methods we could use to achieve this, but to minimise the number of machines required, and to fit with that rustic theme popularised by D&D players, hand engraving seemed to be a fitting technique. I simply wrote the numbers onto the faces with a pen, and followed the pen mark with a graver and a hammer. Yes, etching or machine engraving would be more precise, but I think the imperfections are part of the charm. I polish the faces and apply engraver's wax to help bring out the numbers. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in machining, engineering and science, please consider subscribing to our channel. See you in the next one.